right, guys. How are you? I'm going to take this off. Um, thanks for that warm reception. I was just telling Tina that the energy in here is really warm and tender and fuzzy and gooey, and I feel like we should be eating cupcakes. And <laughs> so it's really, really good to be here with you guys this morning. Let me open this up here. Um, I want to just start off by saying that I... I'm a social media buff. I love engaging in social media. And I hopefully, given the time, want to take some of your questions that may come up for you during our time together. So if you have questions, I'd actually like you to tweet them. Jason told me that a lot of people don't tweet. Is that true? What? This is an abomination. <laughs> Y'all need to get on Twitter. Um, so um, for those of you who do have Twitter, go ahead and tweet your questions or even anything that was said that you like or want to remember. That's actually really helpful for me, too, as a speaker to go back and see what really stuck with um, the people that were in my audience. And so I can remember to keep you know, pushing that point the next time I am in a um, place like this. So tweet your questions. And for those of you non-Twitter people, I may have you ask them <laughs> the old-fashioned way. Um, I'm also on Instagram. And again, I love connecting with y'all. And if I meet you and I know your name and you, you know, follow me and don't, I'll follow you back. I'm all about that. Um, so yeah, that's how I wanted to start here. So my first question for you guys is this. Have you ever sat and thought about what God had in mind when he created you? What words came to his mind? What attitudes he had when he was creating your being? What he may have whispered to the angels? I'd, like, I'd actually like you to sit and think for that for a second. Just what you think came to mind, to God's mind, when he was creating you. I see some of your eyes are closed. You're really imagining that. I like that. Does anyone want to shout out some things that came to mind as you thought about this question? Social. Social. Okay. <laughs> Did he get you right? Is, is that you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. It's good when that works out. Okay. <laughs> okay. Any other things that anyone would, wouldn't mind sharing? Inspiration, okay. That's my mom, by the way. Yes, she is cute. Okay. Any other woman want to share a word they think God had in mind when he was taking his time to knit you? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Did he get that right? Are you action? <laughs> Does anyone know her in here? Is she action-oriented? All right. It's cool when God gets it right, you know? Um, <laughs> but yeah, so um, in case you're wondering, God did have something in mind when he created you, when he created me, when he created your fellow woman. And we see that straight in scripture. And I think you guys are going to be familiar with this first one that I'm going to read to you because it's a very common one. It actually happens to be one of my favorite ones. But it's Psalm 139, 14. Anyone familiar with that one? What is it? Yes, who said that? Good, good girl. Psalm 139.14 says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. And it was actually a psalm that David wrote. So from this, 
we can be um, convinced, or at least made aware, that God created us fearfully. And fearfully, the original Greek word for the way fearfully is used in this passage is yare, Y-A-R-E, but pronounced yare. And that means, by definition, to revere, to stand in awe of, to honor, and to respect. Those are some words that God had in mind when he was creating you and I. The scripture says God also created us wonderfully. And there's a ton of definitions for this word, but one that stood out to me is, well, one phrase that stood out to me is unusually good. Unusually good. God created us not only to be revered and honored and respected, but he made us unusually good. So this is not just any kind of good, right? This is the good of all good. Like if good had a dad, this is, this is the good of good, right? Unusually good. Set apart good. Okay, king good, queen good. Fearfully and wonderfully made, that's how God created us, worthy of honor and respect and unusually good. And I love the way the psalmist David sort of concludes this statement by saying, wonderful all your works, I know that full well, as if to say, I am proof that your works are wonderful. I look at myself, I see my reflection, I see my goodness, and I am proof of how amazing you are and your ability to create unusual usually good things. What confidence, right? How would it, what would it be like to walk around understanding, being convinced, convicted that we are proof of God's marvelousness, right? Ephesians 2.10 is another verse um, that we can reflect on when we're thinking about what God had in mind when he created us. And this verse says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Again, I'm going to read that. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The first thing that jumps out at me from this verse is the fact that God created us purposefully, right? And what was that purpose? What can you get from that verse? What's that purpose? For... Good work. Is that my misaction? There you go. <laughs> okay, for good work. So if you've ever wondered actually what your purpose is, at least in this general sense, it's for good works. And I would even argue that when you have not committed your life to some good work, you're going to feel like something is missing. Okay, can anyone resonate with that a little bit? That until they're doing something, engaging in something for the greater good or for mankind or giving of themselves in their time of their heart and compassion, that something is not right, something is missing, that life has less meaning when we're not involved in these good works. And there's no secret to why that is. That was what we were created for. Again, at least in this general sense, for good works. Um, it's the reason why Jason mentioned in my bio the Ruby Project, and let me talk a little bit about that. Um, the Ruby Project is an organization I started with my friend three years ago upon realizing that we had the same passions for um, empowering and uplifting and coming, on, coming alongside the healing journey of women who've experienced trauma. And so um, over a few conversations and, of course, a lot of prayer and um, some visioning, we created what is known as the Ruby Project um, based on Proverbs 31.10, that a woman is worth far more than rubies. Our desire being to help these girls realize that despite you know, the horrific things that they've been through, despite them being taken advantage of and violated and manipulated and um, hurt you know, physically and emotionally and sexually, that they still were worth far more than rubies. And in addition to that, we both acknowledged that we were artsy people. You know, we both sang, danced, loved poetry, and just were all things art, and had recognized just the power in the arts. I mean, for both of us, um, art was an outlet for us. And 
you know, I'm fortunate enough not to have a background of sexual trauma myself, but I do know pain. You know, I've had my own pains, and for those who have followed me or, you know, will follow me and, and see that I, I make it no secret um, to talk about my uh, experience with bullying. You know, I was pretty badly teased, pretty badly bullied when I was in junior high, um, elementary school, and even a little bit in high school. And so, you know, I, that is an emotional abuse. Can, does anyone not mind raising their hand if they've experienced bullying? Anyone in here? Okay, so we know how much that hurts, right? And, you know, you're very courageous for putting your hand up there. But, um, you know, Pain, pain is pain, and uh, my friend Leslie and I just realized that we really wanted to do something for girls who've experienced these various kinds of abuses, physically, emotionally, and and sexually. And so we got together and we, you know, put this thing put this thing together. And it's the one thing in my life that I don't get paid to do, but it happens to be my favorite thing to do ever. I I actually wish uh, we don't have great Wi-Fi in here. I just thought maybe I can show a, um, our retreat video. But you can, you can go on my website and, and look at our highlight video for our <clears throat> 2014 retreat that we just did last summer. Um, but just, yeah, when I was you know, thinking about just being created for good works, I realized that you know, that, doing the Ruby Project as well as some other things I'm involved in, is just where I feel the most meaning, where I feel the most fulfilled. And, and again, there's no secret there. That's what we were created to do, to do good works. But the other thing that jumps out to me from this verse is the foreplanning and the thoughtfulness involved in God's creation of us. Right? Again, the foreplanning and the thoughtfulness. The scripture says that God prepared these good works beforehand so that we would walk in them. To prepare something beforehand requires thought, right? Are you guys with me? It requires some planning, it requires some thinking through, it requires some intention. And for God to say that, or for God to go ahead and create us, you know, make us evidence of his work and set us in motion for something that prepared, he prepared for us beforehand is just evidence of how much thought he put into creating us and creating our destinies and creating our purpose and creating exactly how he wanted us to go throughout our lives. You guys with me? God had to think through his purpose for us and think through how he wanted to design us for the purpose of these good works and for the purposes of the good goals and dreams that he had for us. So God, yes, created us fearfully and wonderfully and carefully and thoughtfully and on purpose. Nothing about us being created is wrong. Nothing about us being created is on accident. Wonderful and on purpose. That's how God created us. And just to let that sit, I'd actually like you to turn to a neighbor and just declare, I was made wonderfully and on purpose. Go ahead and do that. <laughs> okay. Good. Good. How does that make you feel, guys? How do you feel? Okay? Anyone, you know, feel a little bit of a boost of confidence in just declaring, I have been made wonderfully and on purpose? Okay? Why is this important for this group? I have a few reasons. One, because we're human. Two, because we're women. Three, because uh, at least for some of, it, some of us in here, we're women of color. And for all of us, it's important because if we don't, fa if we fail to realize that we were created wonderfully and on purpose, we will fail to have the love for ourselves, right, and the confidence in ourselves to live up to what God intended for us to be, the great things he intended for us to be, and the unique destiny and purpose he had for our lives without understanding that everything about who we are was made wonderfully, unusually good, and on purpose, we will fail to follow through what God had in mind for us. Again, it's important to understand this as humans. As humans in general, 
we tend to struggle with maintaining a healthy sense of self, right? We all struggle with feelings of self-doubt, right? You know, you can, if you're in here and you're like, I don't know what she's talking about. I ain't never struggled with that a day in my life. Go ahead and tell me, right? But I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure we can all resonate with having feelings of self-doubt and perhaps even more significantly, feelings of, of just a, a general sense of inadequacy, right? Feeling that we're just not good enough, whether it's, you know, smart enough, pretty enough, thin enough, uh, black enough, uh, pink enough, whatever. But that feeling of not feeling good enough, that feeling of inadequacy is something that we as all humans are prone to experience several times throughout our life. We come to understand from personal experience that we're prone to making mistakes. We have shortcomings, we have failings, we do fail at times. And even though we're aware that this is bound to happen because, hey, to err is to, is, to, err is to be human, we're still very uncomfortable with this. As women, we're often burdened with um, additional doubts and concerns. So there's just being a human and then just being a woman, which comes with its own stuff, right? And, as women, we, we tend to have these times where we're concerned with our looks, right? And our bodies and our significance and our um, ability to be loved. Sometimes we doubt that as women. And these concerns are, are magnified by these unattainable standards we see in media or even in social media, because this is you know, kind of taking a mind um, of its own <clears throat> in popular culture. These unattainable standards are kind of everywhere, and we're all subject to them. And um, you know, if we're to be honest with ourselves, it affects us sometimes, right? Oh, I don't look like her. I don't act like her. Then for those. For those of you in here who are women of color, things may get even a little deeper than that, where you experience um, the consequences of ignorance or prejudicial treatment, whether it's from the justice system or, or the law or um, the educational system or the employment system, and you just really you know, brings to question how really and truly respected you are by your fellow mind, mankind, and just having to wonder, you know, are, you, are you taken seriously? Are you looked at equally? Are you valued just as much? Being a human, being a woman, and for some of us in here, being a woman of color adds all these uh, filters and these dimensions and these layers to already just this uh, human kind of experience, struggling to feel that we are right, that we are OK, that we are good enough. And if you think back, you can probably remember the times where you first realize you're a human. And although that sounds funny, by that I mean understanding the realness of your of your humanness and all, all, of, all of what that entails. Um, realizing that you're going to make mistakes. Realizing that you, you, know, you will fall, fall short. That you will fail at times. You know, I remember the first time where I you know, realized my humanness. And I, I have early memories of the first time that I experienced guilt and shame. And I, and I hated it. You know? and, and from that point point, it, 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 you know, it's kind of moved me to wanting to be a perfectionist. Anyone in here a perfectionist like me, right? Because it's like we have this idea that the closer we get to perfection, the further we get away from these feelings of shame or falling short of expectation, which we all will do because we're human. I also remember the first time where I um, realized what it means to be a woman or, or s some of the some, maybe not the very first time, but some of my earliest memories I remember, you know, realizing the power that my femininity held, right? Because you guys, y'all know that holds some power, right? <laughs> Being a woman, you know, you, you guys know, you know? Um, so the, the power that my femininity held, but also, you know, the tenderness that my vulnerabilities um, created. I remember learning that being a woman means loving hard, falling in love hard, and maybe falling out of love, even the, the hardest thing ever. Who can resonate with that? Don't lie. <laughs> OK. I remember. Uh, when I first realized I was a black woman, in addition to that, um, some experiences in grade school, you know, being the only one of my peers who wore braids in my hair and who would um, 
What, what do we do? And is anyone, you're braising your hair. Yeah, like this, see? Tell me your name again, hon. Ashley. Ashley. Okay, when is the first time you realized that no one else but black girls did that? It was a little late in life. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, that's, girl, that's not late. That's like, you're still an embryo at 12. <laughs> Okay, but you remember, right? At least at that point, remember, oh, something's different about the way I wear my hair. And let's, let's take it back further. Do you remember having to burn, burn the ends? Remember back in the day? Yeah, right? You stick it in the cup. I choose it because I was little. Yeah, you know, it's just something. Yeah. Any other uh, black girls in here remember the braid and the burning? Anyone else? Okay, yeah, don't be shy, you know? Okay, we all remember our first time realizing we were just human, realizing we were women, realizing we were a woman of color. And with that, I actually, I actually want to spend a little bit more time in that and having you talk in pairs about the first time you remember realizing you were a person, you were a woman, or you were a woman of color. So reflect on that for a second and um, share with someone at your table, if you don't mind. All right, come back to me. I am actually going to encourage at least two of you to, to share just really concisely when the first time you realized you were a person, a human, or a woman of color. And there's a mic right here in the middle, so don't be shy. OK, I see a volunteer. Do I see? Oh, I thought she was getting up. You know the Holy Spirit is talking to you. <laughs> Someone from this table, you guys look like you were having a great conversation. All right, Carol. Okay, yeah. Well, actually, I think it helps them get the, get the stuff, yeah, so. Hi, everyone. My name is Kara. And um, I guess the first time I thought I was, a, or I realized I was a woman, or female, was, I was telling Heidi, I was in a co-ed basketball league, mm. and I was being recruited to a women's league, or a girls' league. I was like, what? No, I want to play with the boys. They're mm. fun. They're strong. They're going to build me up. Um, but yeah, that was like the first time I remember thinking, I'm different, mm. or I'm not like boys, mm -hmm. so <laughs> that was fourth grade, by the way. Um, yeah, I grew up a tomboy. 
<laughs> and um, I'm going to bug you a little bit more. Carol, that's your name? Kara, C-A-R-A? K-A-R, -A. that's pretty. Um, what, what was that like for you? What, what did you learn about yourself in that moment from not realizing that you were not a boy? <laughs> he wake up. <laughs> what? <laughs> Well, just like, what, what were some of the first thoughts you had? Was it, were you excited? Were you disappointed that you couldn't play with the boys? Did you yeah. feel less strong? Like what what kind of came to mind when you realized you couldn't be on the boys' team? Yeah, I, I responded to the guy rather aggressively. <laughs> it was after a game. I don't know if we won, but it was after a game. I was tired. I just wanted to go back home. And he's like, hey, we're recruiting for the women's team, and we were watching you. You look really good. I'm like, I'm the only girl on my team. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, okay, well, we just we we want to you know take you into practice and watch you shoot around a bit. And I'm just like, um, no, I like my team right now. I like playing with the guys. You mm. know, I I want to stay strong. I don't want to join a girls' mm. league. Right, right. Okay, thank you, Kara. <laughs> Let's have someone from another table. Yeah, come on up, hon. What's your name? Angela. Angela. Yep, get to that mic, girl. <laughs> Hi, so yes, I'm Angela, and I play the ear. So it was the story of when I first kind of figured out I was Chinese. Mm. So um, my dad's a pastor, and we visited a lot of churches. So when I was about elementary age, I guess, we went to a white church. Mm. And I just remember I was getting along fine with the kids, and then this one white boy, he came up, and he did this. And he would mm. follow me around all day doing that. And that's mm. when I kind of figured out, like, he's making fun of me. Mm. Uh, and if you know me, you, kn you know I'm pretty reserved. Back then, I was not. I, I <laughs> did not have a filter. <laughs> uh, yeah, I had less of a filter. So I gave him, like, this dirtiest stink eye and, like, stormed off. And I, I like, ranted at these other children. And they got, like, I was so glad I did that because then they actually went up to the teacher for me and said, like, this boy's doing something. Mm. Made him apologize. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. And uh, was it Tina? I'm sorry. Angela. Where did I get Tina from? <laughs> Angela. Um, is there a Tina in here? Oh, oh. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Um, and what was that like for you, hon? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing. And just because those two were so good, I actually want to take one more. Because this is really fascinating. So one more. Somebody, somebody back there. I don't know what I'm singing, but anyone from back there? I know, right? <laughs> Tina, you were in my spirit. Do you want to... Yes. <laughs> okay, well, I shared with um, my table that uh, in third grade, we our, my elementary school closed, and it was very diverse. It was in a, a part of town that I grew up in, and um, we had to get bused to another school that was kind of up in the more expensive area of town. <laughs> And um, everybody was blonde hair, blue eyed. And we came in and um, I felt like an intruder. Mm. That's kind of how they made it seem. Mm -hmm. And um, everybody like played tennis and played golf. And mm. me and my friends were like, who the heck plays tennis? You know, <laughs> <laughs> we're like, okay. <laughs> Just really <laughs> feeling <laughs> out of place and um, kind of like a fish out of water. So mm. that was third grade. Mm. So. Yeah. So Tina's third grade, fourth grade-ish, and Kara, fourth grade. Okay, so pretty early on in life. Um, everyone else who, I mean, just a show of hands, who were sharing stories that happened that early in life or even earlier? Yeah. 
Okay, so pretty early in life, we've all had experiences of being different, you know, of understanding our humanness, understanding our womanness, understanding us as being um, a woman of color. And uh, from all of those experiences, there's a sort of an overlapping theme of it not being a, at least initially, a, a positive experience, right? There was a little bit of a, whoa, I, I, I'm, A, I'm realizing I'm different, but who I'm realizing I'm different around is not necessarily making it out to be a good thing, right? You guys get that? You guys sense that? Show of hands, who else had stories where that realization of difference wasn't the most positive experience, at least at that point, show of hands. Okay, so a lot of you in the room. So um, why, why am I sort of uh, drawing this out now? I think it's really obvious that if we don't take care to define ourselves or to base our definition on what, uh, how God looks at us, it's really going to be easy to fall prey to the ways other people want to define us, right? And a lot of times, the ways that other people want to define us are not the most positive ways, whether it's intruder or uh, there was another word you said after an intruder. I can't remember it. Do you remember what you said after intruder? Fish out of water, yeah, yeah. And, you know, difference kind of, it, it, different should be a neutral word, but unfortunately a, a lot of the way people use different these days sort of has a negative connotation, right? Ooh, like she's different, right? That's how, that's how we hear it. Another word that um, is starting to have a negative connotation for me is um, interesting. Don't lie. You guys know when you guys say interesting. It's not, <laughs> it's not like, oh, interesting, awesome. It's like... <laughs> we know, we know. So it's it's funny how the word different and in interesting has um, sort of taken on that toll. But my point here, ladies, is that we have to be really intentional about defining ourselves because these things, as you see, aren't these these experiences aren't things that we remember. As I asked you guys to recall them, you did not have a difficult time recalling some of the exp experiences where you realized your womanness, or you realized you're a woman of color, or you realized that you were human. And you know, to some degree, you still carry what you learned about yourself even till now. And those are things that happen in our past. You know, what about things that um, that we see in, in media that try to tell us who we are, tell us we're to that to this or to that, you know, things we see in TV, things we see in film, things we see even in social media. If we don't take time, if we aren't careful to define ourselves for ourselves, something else will. What did God say about us, ladies? Fearfully and wonderfully made, unusually good, right? Wonderful and on purpose. And that's something that I want you guys to, to continue to sit with, is that you were made wonderfully and on purpose. Um, I'm working with a girl right now who has had who has had you know this particular struggle and how I'm going to end this story is um, it's, it's going to launch what I want you guys to do you know after this and time is actually running away from us because I actually planned on saying a lot more but but it, it's okay um, so this girl um, she's now 21 I'll call her Jenny that's not her name but I'll call her Jenny um, she's biracial, half black, half Mexican, and beautiful. Um, even by you know conventional standards, she's beautiful. But um, she doesn't feel that way about herself, and it's probably because of her experience of being physically abused by um, many, uh, several of the guys that she has dated. And it's kind of interesting how it kind of works out that way that when you 
Um, it, it's a psychological thing for sure. When you are, you know, victimized one time, you tend to find yourself in situations where you continue to be victimized over and over again until you really step back and maybe get some help from a professional and realize what is going on there and what are the forces that are sort of pulling you back into the same type of situations. And, and I'll say right now that a big part is how you define yourself and, and how, um, how, to what degree you internalize God's view and vision of you. But um, she has, she, I'm working with her because she struggles with her own self-esteem. And again, probably in part because of what she's been through at the hands of previous boyfriends, even in her um, family. She comes from a, um, a home where her father uh, was a heavy drug user, and it, you know what she experienced was her father choosing drugs over her. You know, so that kind of absolutely affected how you know worthy um, she felt. I know she shared a story with me that in her on her eighth grade uh, graduation, she had straight up asked her dad, you know, are you gonna you know sit back home and and um, you know, get high, you're gonna come to my eighth grade graduation. And he didn't say anything, so she left, and he never, he never made it to the graduation. So it's like she had um, her, the, the answer to her question right there of him choosing his drugs over her. So she had that, and she had you know, previous ex-boyfriends, and, and now as she's trying to enter um, relationships, it's really, really hard for her to, to be healthy in these relationships. She just kind of accepts whatever men do to her, whatever they say to her. And, and there's something about people, not just men, but there's something about people in general that will go as far as you let them. Do you guys know that about people? People will go as far as you let them. You know, I, I, I tweeted one thing like, um, uh, a couple months ago that, you know, I guess really resonated with people about how the way you carry yourself sets the standard for how people will treat you. You know that? Um, if you carry yourself with your head held high and you kind of have that it's not, no, you know, kind of attitude about you. People are not going to mess with you as much as sort of walking around like, you know, like you don't feel greatly about, the, greatly about yourself. And so, um, you know, between her body language and just what she accepted, you know, she ha she's gotten better now, but at least when we initially started working together, I just had really struggled to maintain healthy relationships with people. And my point here is that it all came back to her self-definition. She didn't feel very, very good about herself. Um, she didn't, you know, feel very valuable. She didn't feel worthy. You know, she felt like um, she was, it, it, it was um, legitimate of, of it was, it was legitimate for, for drugs to be picked over her. She internalized that. You know, she felt like she had somehow deserved the beating she got from the boyfriends that she was with. And she just took that all inside and, and, and sort of, you know, that became her. But as I've been working with her and as, you know, she's been just, you know, seeking out support on account of the conversations we've had, you know, she's, you know, finally starting to, to take on, God's view of her finally starting to internalize that God says she is unusually good and she was made wonderfully and on purpose. And it's being able to internalize that or slowly internalizing that that is helping her be able to put her head up a little bit higher and you know say no to the things that she should be saying no to when it comes to what these guys want to do to her and how they want to take advantage of her. The importance of self-definition. And so the last thing I want to kind of have you guys do is actually to turn back, <clears throat> excuse me, into, into your pairs and talk about, talk about who you are, talk about, let me say this carefully so it doesn't become confusing, share with each other words that come to mind that you know are of God when it comes 
to you. Does that make sense? So you may be already believing it or you may be trying to believe it, but I think we already have a sense of what God wants to teach us about ourselves. And I want you to begin, you know, declaring that to each other. Does that make sense? Okay, so turn to a neighbor and again, share what what you know about yourself or what you know God wants you to know about yourself and speak that into the universe. All right, come back to me. And I, I'm actually going to have us actually go around and share just one word, just one word, only no sentence, no comma, no hyphens, just one, one word that comes to mind, um, and one thing that you shared that you know, you know, because we all, we all are in touch with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is trying to communicate with us. And sometimes it just takes sitting and listening, open up, open, opening up your heart and asking God, asking the Holy Spirit, what do you want for me to get out of this moment, out of this day? And, you know, I, I saw all of you guys talking, so I know that the Holy Spirit is trying to, you know, pull you up and continue to un- uplift you and empower you and teach you about yourself, teach you about who you are and to make what your current image is about yourself look more like what his attitude was for you when he when he created you when he knit you in your mother's womb so i want us to go around and and share one word because there's something about speaking out things or something really powerful about letting it escape what's in here and letting it come um, from your vocals again there's something very powerful about word you just look at what all of what god did just through his word something very powerful about words so if you're ever struggling to believe something practice saying it out loud it'll do something for you okay so just each one of us just one word and i actually want to pay attention I want each of you to pay attention to who's saying what. And I would actually encourage you to refer to each other as that word when you see each other or out, out, out on campus or, you know, dorms. You know, like, you guys hopefully know each other's real names, but, you know, hey, strong. Hey, wisdom. Hey, true. You know, actually, let me tell you something, because I'm Nigerian, a Nigerian-American. I think I mentioned that. And names like that are actually really common in our culture. So, you guys, my name is Peace. I have a sister named Patience. A brother named Promise. You know, I have um, cousins named Love and Joy and Hope. And so there's something really cool about calling someone by virtue or or by, you know, uh, power and by truth. So remember who's saying what and try to refer to each other at least one time after this uh, diversity, okay? So let's start with this young lady right here. Just one word and we'll just go around. Actually, can we pass the mic? Just, yeah. Do you mind grabbing it and just pass it around? We'll make it all the way around the room. Um, no names. Forget your name. Just, <laughs> you know, you're, let's go with your new name. What God wants you to remember about yourself. Loyal. Wise. Hold on. We're going to have you do it again because you sounded like you were unsure. <laughs> <laughs> she said wise. Wise. Okay. Trustworthy. Encouraging. Mm-hmm. Optimistic. Mm-hmm. Cherished. Mm-hmm. Beloved. Mm-hmm. Loved. Mm-hmm. Enough. Mm-hmm. Worthy. Mm-hmm. Worthy. Mm-hmm. Wise. Resilient, mm. precious, mm. inclusion, mm. Uh, connection, mm. loved, mm. capable. Mm. Mom, did you want to? <laughs> Gifted. <laughs> <laughs> Wise. Mm-hmm. Strong. Mm-hmm. Joy, mm-hmm. reliable, equipped, mm. purpose, mm. valued, humble, loved, mm. compassionate, patient, capable, mm. 
encouraging. Right. Purpose. Strong. Mm -hmm. Passionate. Mm -hmm. Compassionate. <laughs> Listener. Passionate. Affirmed. Yeah. Genuine. Yeah. Discerning. Yeah. Entrepreneur. Mm. <laughs> and I'll say mine. Mine was also enough. I heard somebody else um, say that. So um, that's what I wanted to leave you guys with uh, this morning. And again, just you know, practice those words, say those words out loud, refer to each other as those words, and just remember that um, your self-definition de is, it is a conversation, but it, it's one that only you and God should, should be having, okay? So, yeah, let, let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for loving us the way you do, God, for taking the care that you did to create every ounce of our being, for knitting us thoughtfully in our mother's room, wonderfully, God, and on purpose. God, help us to remember what you thought of and what you still think of us, Lord. Help us to love ourselves the way we should and to find our confidence the way we should by putting it in you and your immense love for us and the immense thought that you put in creating us and setting us on to our purpose, Lord Jesus. God, encourage us in the way we need to be encouraged this morning. Help us to remember just who we are in you. And also equip us to encourage our fellow brothers and sisters who may be struggling even more than we are in their sense of self and so self-esteem. God, we love you. You are so awesome. And everything that we are, God, just all glory goes to you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Don't you feel full and not from the food, <laughs> but from just the presence of God and just the word that went forth. Thank you, Peace. That was amazing. Um, we all need to be reminded who we are and who God created us to be. And that was such a powerful word. Thank you. Um, that concludes our time together. You guys don't have to leave. You can still sit around and chit chat. Um, we do have alumni open if anyone would like to um, have some time with Peace. Uh, for about an hour and just kind of talk some more and pick her brain maybe. <laughs> uh, we definitely have that available. So thank you all for coming. Be blessed today. Amen.